Okay, <clears throat> hello everyone. Um, thanks for being here. <clears throat> um, the conference is going to be in English um, today. So I uh, just one more thing the, I will ask the people in the meeting so they can stay mute and the camera off for now. And uh, the conference is going to last about 40 minutes uh, or an hour. And then we will have time to ask some questions at the end. Uh, if anyone wants to participate or ask some questions, they can write it in the chat uh, on YouTube or you can send us an email or whatever you want to ask, uh, you can do it at the end. So, well, um, that's the formal thing. My name is Federico Menichetti. I'm going to present today. Uh, Daniel is going to give us a conference about his work. So let me introduce him. Uh, Daniel Bolochan is an art as assistant professor focusing on the application of computational design and one of the leading voices in the impl implementation of deep learning strategies in architecture and architectural design processes. Uh, over the years, he has taught several design studios and seminars at the Institute of uh, Structure and Design, Univers uh, design University of Innsbruck, Florida. Um, and conducted numerous international workshops and conference workshops dealing with the application of complex systems and neural networks in architectural design. Uh, he's currently a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Applied Arts Institute of Architecture in Vienna. Daniel received his bachelor's degrees and master's degrees in the same institute uh, where he studied under the late architect Sacha Hadid and Patrick Schumacher at the Sacha Hadid Vienna studio. He later joined the research project, uh, Asian based parametric semi semiology research uh, grant funding from uh, Derwis and Schaff funds um, as research fellow under the supervision of PI Patrick Schumacher. Uh, the research explores Asian based systems as Asian based life process simulations, architectural crowds, in order to operationalize the systematic layer between the design process where the semiological code is defined in terms of the Asian behavioral rules when introducing, interacting with a variety of special features. In 2013, uh, he founded his own research studio, Non-Stardom Studio. Over the years, through Non-Stardom Studio's work, Daniel Design Research developed at the intersection between generative design, computational, and multi-Asian systems, neural networks, deep learning, and machine learning. The studio focuses on generative design strategies and algorithmic techniques that target the creation of highly complex autopoietic systems that could offer new opportunities for the architectural organization, articulation, and signification. These strategies emerge from growth processes, rule-based multi-agent systems, and bottom-up driving designs. Upon graduation, Daniel joined the international renowned office Kap Himmelblau in Vienna, Austria, as computational designer there, he had the opportunity to practice as on numerous international renowned projects and competitions. Shortly after joining Cop Himalai, Daniel held the position of junior associate, computational design specialist and founder uh, and head of CHBL code. As head of CHBL code, he held the leading role of developing custom computational design tools, uh, standalone apps, plugins, and add-ons, computational design strategies, virtual and augmented reality applications, machine learning, and neural networks applications, as well as robotic fabrication processes. He is responsible for the office uh, current drive to develop deep learning strategies aimed to at, at the augmentation of the design's native abilities through the development of deep Himalblau neural networks. So I'm glad to welcome Daniel. Uh, nice to be to, to have you here. So I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, the invitation. It's really great to be here. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen right now. It seems that Google Hangout here is uh, freezing on my screen. So let me see if, if it's going to work. It's going on. You lost network connection.
Okay, sorry everyone. I think we lost connection with Daniel. Let me see if we can have a solution for that. Uh, can we can can you hear me? I can. There we can hear you. Very good. Okay. My inter, uh, my connection dropped exactly when you finished um, introducing me. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so again, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me know if you're able to see. All right, so I assume that you're able to see now my screen. Uh, so once again, thank you everyone for uh, for being here and thank you for uh, inviting me to give a lecture. Um, so um, today I'm going to, to show you some of the work that um, I've been exploring for the past like four or five years almost now. Um, so my, my research mostly uh, like um, I was already introduced I'm really interested in these aspects of complex systems, agent-based systems um, as generative model and also as uh, agent-based life processes, like uh, this kind of uh, semiological kind of crowds. Um, and then since 2016, roughly, um, I started being more and more interested in um, creative AIs. Um, and there are two main recurring themes in this research. Uh, one of those themes is this this idea of uh, encoding intelligence and articulation of design processes in which design intention and architectural intelligence are embedded somehow within emergent processes and the second theme is um, mostly this idea of creative ai which explores the potential of teaching machines to interpret perceive to be creative so in many aspects uh, my research really revolves around this kind of idea of uh, which are the components parts of a machine that is being uh, that is creative and what it means for a machine to be creative yeah. so um, this creative ai research uh, raised multiple questions regarding design agency creativity but mostly i'll focus on two main questions today uh, one of them is can ai driven processes augment creative agency and the second one uh, can ai be used to expand the design space beyond the designer accepted boundaries and to address these questions, I'll try to provide somehow at the beginning a sort of base of what I mean by creative AI and creativity. Uh, I will try to draw a few distinctions there. Um, and um, most, most of the examples that I'm going to show are part of this bigger agenda where I'm actually trying to create machines that uh, somehow are creative. So it's good to, um, if we look at if we look at the, the models that we have today, there are quite a few different types of uh, generative models. Like um, a few years ago, like uh, generative artificial networks were very popular. They were the state of the art in terms of image synthesis. And uh, since uh, one year, two year, one year, yeah, this year, one year almost, uh, we start to, to see more and more this kind of network like DALI, uh, Party, Midjourney, and so on, and Pathway and uh, autoregressive models that are more capable and are currently state-of-the-art in terms of uh, image synthesis. Yeah? Um, so here, I'll stress that idea. We are talking about still uh, a network that is able to perform the task of image synthesis. We are not claiming that the network is able to somehow understand architecture just by looking at an image, but it's able to create convincing images of uh, examples of architecture. Yeah? Um, so how do we define if something is creative. If we evaluate the results of these generative models, we can interpret perhaps the outcomes as creative because there's a sort of level of novelty involved and uh, as well uh, a sort of level of novelty appreciation. And I think it's always good to talk about this, this idea of the creative curve. According to Alan uh, Gardner, um, that distinction that you have novelty uh, 
appreciation, it's significant because if something is too novel for us as humans, we cannot appreciate it, you know? And if it's too unexpected and too unrelated, we still can't appreciate it. Uh, if it's too similar to what we already know, we still can't appreciate it. But there is this sweet spot where ideas that we, uh, that we appreciate as creative have a sort of blend of, similar, of familiarity and, uh, and novelty. And all ideas and what's happening with them, all ideas they have this kind of point of overexposure uh, where they start to become cliche and they start to lose popularity and uh, don't fall until they are out of date in a way. And I'll say this kind of a creative curve, if we are looking now real time, what's happening with Me Journey and Dali and so on, they were very cool a few weeks ago. Uh, but if you generate the same way that you generated a few weeks ago with uh, with Journey and with Ali, uh, probably the results are not that interesting anymore. Yeah, so almost like this kind of creative curve, it's almost like accelerating right now. Yeah. Um, so there is also a significant distinction that uh, we need to make uh, between the view that um, creativity resides solely in the artifact and it's assessed by society, and also the view that some processes have the capacity to generate artifacts that are deemed creative. Um, as my research mostly develops on uh, this kind of potential of the machine of machines uh, being able to interpret, perceive, and to be creative, I'm more intrigued by the second uh, perspective, yeah, where um, this kind of capacity of certain processes to produce artifacts yeah, uh, that are deemed creative. Uh, although understanding how social um, evaluation of these kind of artifacts determines whether or not it's uh, creative, yeah? I think it's quite important still to understand the side of it, yeah? So what is creativity? Uh, if we look at uh, ancient cultures, they lacked our current understanding of creativity. Uh, they consider, in a way, creativity as a form of discovery, and then they start to uh, be associated with the concept of imagination. And only in the uh, uh, late 19th century, uh, Poincare and Helmholtz, um, they start to publish their creative processes by pioneering, in a way, the study of, or scientific study of creativity. But although um, the scientific study of creativity started to produce a lot of theories, models, and systems, um, defining creativity in objective terms was and is still um, very challenging. If we are looking at cognitive scientists, um, Margaret Bowden, um, her work focused on, on this kind of uh, idea of creativity. And um, in her uh, work, she identifies three main types of human creativity. One is combinational, uh, combinatorial, exploratory, and transformational. And the idea of combinatorial uh, kind of creativity, it produces unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. Yeah? So you, we are just mostly mis mixing existing ideas. And through that kind of mixing, uh, we end up with uh, new you know, ideas. Uh, explorative uh, creativity, or exploratory creativity, rests on some cultural accepted style of thinking or conceptual space. Uh, in, in exploratory uh, creativity, the person moves more or less through this space, exploring it to find what is out there, yeah? to discover both the potential and the limits of the space in question. Yeah? In a case, we can also almost say that they are working with it a specific style. Yeah? Uh, in terms of um, transformational creativity, uh, we can say that space or the style itself is transformed by altering or dropping one or more of its um, defining dimension, dimensions. Ideas now can be generated that simply could have not been generated before the change. Yeah? Um, so similarly, um, in computer science, Demi Sasabi's creator of uh, DeepMind identifies uh, three types of machine creativity. One is interpolative, extrapolative, and inventive. Um, so neural networks, they are very, very good at interpolation uh, because they are these this massive um, statistical machines that are able or are very good at averaging and detecting patterns in data. Uh, but as designers, if we, we, if we think about it, we engage in a very similar mode of operation of creativity in a way, similar with combin combinatorial kind of creativity, uh, where we start to combine and interpolate like previously known ideas.
But neural networks are not that good at extrapolation. There are just a few networks that uh, are capable of uh, extrapolative creativity. And even uh, those networks, I'll say, it's a limited form of extrapolative creativity. Um, and um, networks, for sure, are not very good at invention. They are not capable to invent something completely new, in a way, at this point. Uh, but this diagram, in a way, tries to describe that. You know? So interpolation, mostly you're looking at your data set, and by averaging points in your data set, you're creating something new. Uh, extrapolation will be to create something that is not necessarily within your data set. Yeah? Uh, and invention will be almost like to create uh, the game, a new game. Yeah? Uh, neural network, uh, networks are still not good at uh, concepts, at abstractions, analogies, uh, or a reading by analogy, imagination. So there are still a lot of uh, domains that I'll say um, neural networks are not really um, that good at yet. Um, so although AI can exhibit uh, a sort of form of intelligence um, and a form of creativity, uh, we should not equate or put an equal sign between human creativity and uh, and machine creativity, yeah? or human intelligence and machine intelligence. And very often we are stuck in this uh, in questions like this: like, uh, is it possible for a machine to see the same way as a human does, or is it is the machine capable or able to uh, be creative as a human is? And for me, uh, similar with, uh, or I'm siding mostly with Alan Turing here, uh, I think that's irrelevant, yeah? Um, Alan Turing was uh, answering this question uh, by saying, uh, can a machine perform something that can be described as seeing, but is very different from how humans see? Um, and in the end, he also ends uh, uh, this, this idea with, we should not penalize uh, the machine for its inability to shine in beauty competitions, nor do we want to pen penalize a human for not being able to compete with uh, with an airplane. Yeah. Um, just a brief, you know, detour here in um, computer science. So, uh, in his paper, um, intelligent machinery, he started to introduce a variety of types of machines. Yeah different types of machines that allow different degrees of intelligence and degrees of uh, creativity perhaps to emerge. And um, some of those machines are uh, logical computing machines, unorganized machines, and modifiable and self-modifying machine. And those models are more or less at the core of what today we define experts as expert systems and as learning systems. Uh, so on the left side, you have uh, logical mathematical uh, models. And on the right side, you have unorganized machines, uh, which are basically neural networks. Uh, neural networks. And um, it, this was, these neural networks, in a way, they were modeled based on the, the idea how the brain works, at least um, based on their understanding in the 1940s of how the brain works, yeah? Uh, this shift from expert systems to learning system uh, represents today one of the most significant shifts um, in in computer science and also in other kind of industries, not only in architecture. But I think it's going to have a big impact um, in architecture as well, not only in the other fields. Um, this kind of expert systems, they, they were very popular in uh, 70s and 80s, and just in 2006, um, um, learning systems started to be more, um, more popular. So if we think about what a learning system is or expert system, um, an expert system, we can say it's a, a sort of knowledge system, um, are systems that are based on uh, logic uh, and they feature hard-coded solutions. Yeah? Uh, they require a human or an expert to input information into the knowledge base. Yeah? While on the other hand, um, learning systems, uh, which are systems based on neural networks, rely on, uh, they don't rely on hard-coded solutions, but they learn by example. They learn fr solutions from first principle. Um, because of these differences, um, expert systems are not able to generalize, are unable to generalize, uh, and they're very limited to pre-programmed solutions, making them um, unable to, to have solutions to unforeseen conditions, yeah? Um, we can also say almost like um, they are great perhaps to be used to solve sequential problems with finite steps yeah, that we are already aware of. 
uh, when uh, learning systems on the other end, they can generalize and they can offer new solutions to un unforeseen uh, UI conditions. Uh, they are uh, mostly effective when uh, you want to find insights that you may not even know about uh, when you have a significant amount of uncertainty in your problem. So just a few examples of learning systems and mostly um, today I'm going to talk just about learning systems, not so much about expert systems. Um, some of these uh, learning systems, uh, maybe some of you you're already familiar with, uh, GANs, they were very popular. Um, they're still popular, but they, they lost uh, state of the art in terms of image generation uh, this year. Uh, so we have GANs, we have uh, variational autoencoders, we have flow based uh, models and diffusion models, which are pretty much um, mid journey and DALI type of networks. Yeah? Or DALI and mid journey, they are diffusion type of networks. So here, um, as designers, we we start to engage in this uh, with this kind of networks, and we are pretty confident in a way that we are moving away from um, from this kind of rule based um, expert systems, you know, uh, like uh, computational tools or parametric design and so on. Yeah? Uh, and we feed these kind of networks with uh, GANs and, and diffusion models with a lot of samples, architectural samples, let's say, and um, and these deep networks are able to learn some other representation of the data that we put in, you know. And the question for me is always whether or not uh, your model is able to generalize. You know? uh, so what's happening if uh, your model is not able to generalize? Uh, what if uh, what is happening if your model is overfitting? And here what we are talking about when we are saying um, overfitting and um, generalize so I'm always giving this example of uh, you have a professor teaching uh, some course material in the class. And at the end of the class, the professor is trying to give you an exam to try to figure out if you were able to learn the principles that were taught in class. Yeah? And uh, what will happen during the exam, usually the professor is going to uh, create a new scenario that uh, is going to present you with, and you'll have to prove that you're able to take the knowledge that was delivered to you during class and you're able to apply that knowledge to the new scenario. And if you're able to do that, that means you learn. Yeah? If not, if you're not able to translate that, then probably you just memorized uh, what was taught in class yeah? and you didn't actually, uh, you're not able to solve new solutions, yeah? new uh, problems. So when it comes to architecture, um, I, I've, I see many architects arguing that um, uh, when when you work with creative task, there's no there's no issue if you have a network that overfits or underfits, um, because they uh, they find value in these kind of artifacts that result out of these uh, poorly trained networks. Yeah, and for me, all that's good, but I'm always like bothered by this question of um, um, why 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 do I need then an our network to create for me something like that? Yeah. Uh, I can use other processes. And for example, uh, it's a, a sort of ironical kind of a slide, but um, how is a network that it's overfitting more different than a blender? Yeah? You just put things inside, you spin it up, and then some strange, interesting results are going to come out of that. Yeah? And for me, a machine that overfits is no more creative intelligent than a blender that simply spins up whatever you put in without learning any relationships between uh, the elements you put in. And I like this, this uh, quote from Poncare, science is built up of facts as a house is built of stones. But an accumulation of facts is no more a science than a heap of stone, it's a house. So in order to, to be um, able to use um, these uh, this processes in the design process, a network must demonstrate that uh, it was able to understand the correlations between different features offered in the data set. A network must be able to demonstrate its ability to generalize. Yeah? Otherwise, um, like I said, we are mostly just spinning them things up. And for me, generalization, I see it as a prerequisite for new solutions to be proposed to unforeseen scenarios. Um, so here, if we are looking at this, this idea, um, John Giro was uh, um, giving this example in you know, one of his um, um, papers. 
where you have this kind of idea specific problem that you're looking at how you drag in a way a, a block of stone and, and the first solution was you simply just drag it yeah you have a lot of people trying to drag that yeah and then the second solution you start to understand the problem and say okay what if i start to remove the, the friction with the ground what if i start to add some logs in between the ground and the stone and suddenly you have something a solution to that problem yeah but you see in a way that that idea starts to be generalized and suddenly we can think about what if you have the same kind of principle and you translate it now and you create a shopping cart or a suitcase you know or suddenly uh hovering in a way uh, aircraft or something or even more uh, more uh, closer to uh, to our day today what if you start to reduce friction between two elements yeah, because this is the principle that you learn in the you have the specific problem and the specific solution so the idea is how you reduce the friction between the ground and the stone yeah so here the same principle is learned and you're saying how do i further remove in a way friction by removing completely air air and uh, and um, um this kind of high speed in a way than a hyperloop you know um how do i remove uh, air friction there yeah and you have an object now floating in the void yeah and suddenly it's the same principle if you think about it it's just that uh, it was you're able to generalize that core principle and come up with completely new solutions yeah and for me that that's that's um what i love uh, architects to take from neural networks yeah like how can we work with neural networks and be able to to come up with solutions to existing problems solutions that are new solutions yeah okay um so going back to creativity then for me pretty much creativity i see it as simply um some uh, a form or something that has to do with search and with synthesis uh, we hear a lot uh, about this kind of idea of artistic creativity and mostly always when we talk about creativity we are always thinking about artistic in a way but if we think about creativity in other domains such as scientific creativity which produces many many beautiful new theories in mathematics or physics once you you start to uh, to get into this form of domains uh, i'm not sure how much of what we call today creativity is nothing more than a form of, uh, a form of meaningful random search uh, and basically structuring how you are searching for the right things. The two main components there for sure it's this kind of idea of synthesis and search. Uh, so certain people they have this kind of ability to shape the direction in which they are going to look for new things. Uh, when you talk to composers, for example, they are going to uh, show you how they start from a very simple string, and from that they start to enhance and manipulate and almost like uh, warp you know, by the space, and suddenly they start to have a melody emerging out of that. Yeah, it's almost like they are shaping the conceptual space or warping it. Yeah. So one question there will be that can AI augment some? Um, can AI augment? How we conduct conduct meaningful uh, random searches and design exploration. Then, um, according to Costas, uh, this game he also um, has a similar view where he's talking about this idea of uh, what AI establishes above all else is that everything possible, every possible form, it's already out there, and it's simply a question or a matter of searching for it. And Neil Leach also has a similar take on this. Uh, where he's saying it's merely a question of conducting the right search it's not about the designer inventing some new proposal by drawing upon his or her genius but rather of selecting the best solution from a range of existing possible options so what is the point of engaging with this kind of extremely sophisticated learning machines when the results are ultimately evaluated by a human uh, being uh, because all those outcomes will be constrained somehow by our own limitations we are frequently um, unaware of um, if we are when we are trapped in a local minima or global minima of design yeah? um, and this is something that also lisa doll observed after he lost to um, to uh, deep blue um, no sorry to alphago uh, where he was saying that what surprised me the most was uh, that AlphaGo showed us that moves humans may have thought are creative were actually very conventional. Um, 
So without doubt, you know, like this kind of uh, human agency uh, is important, but I think it's also important for us to understand uh, that we bring also certain limitations in this process, yeah? Because we are the ones evaluating these uh, results. Um, so the idea is, um, can AI then augment and help us somehow expand our design space beyond our accepted boundaries? How do we know if uh, we are stuck in a local minima or if we are operating into a global uh, maximum? Um, so to, to approach this idea, uh, already in 2016, I started to, to explore this, uh, these ideas and start to look at how we can use AI somehow to, to help you visualize perhaps design spaces. And traditionally, uh, we, the way that you'll start designing is from an empty piece of paper, you start to draw, and then by drawing and drawing, uh, your design space starts to get more focused or start to be more constrained, you know, yeah? Uh, but I think these days, probably we are going to, we are going to, uh, we are working actually completely differently. We are starting from many, many options, and then we start to pick and select, and from there we, uh, we start to, um, to engage with things. So all, all these kind of creative processes that we engage with, uh, with uh, they create very, very large design space possibilities, yeah? design uh, spaces of possibilities. Uh, so this is just a tiny example. It's pretty much the same concept. It's just that um, we have um, different types you know, of objects that I can generate with a similar concept in the end. Um, how do we know that we are stuck into, into a global or local minima? Yeah? So this is, a, this is a problem that as, as designers, we might, we, Probably we think that we are creative, but in many instances, probably uh, uh, we are not really that creative. Probably we are really acting quite uh, conventional. Uh, so for me, it's always then also this idea of, you have this idea of hunting a needle, uh, a needle in a haystack. Uh, when we talk about design, the way that I see it is uh, hunting a needle in a flock of birds that constantly changes. Because design is almost like this kind of ever, contracting and expect, expanding uh, space of possibilities, yeah? Because I'm taking a decision and uh, my design space either increases, like expands or either, or contracts, you know, yeah? And then I take another decision and it starts to increase or to compress again, yeah? So it's ever changing in a way, this kind of design space. And that's also one of the um, biggest challenges when it comes to design and AI in a way, because design is such a complex in a way human behavior. So slowly I start to develop these kind of tools of um, uh, design space explorers uh, where you kind of have this kind of idea of uh, I'm just defining here and there a few things and I'll allow AI to fill, uh, fill out the blanks in a way. You know? So it's almost like I just have a rough idea about something and can AI somehow fill up the blanks. Yeah? So here uh, I was working with agent-based systems and I was just defining a few ideas, um, design intents that I were very, I was very interested in, and then I will allow you know, like, uh, a network to expand based on those um, uh, design intention or those kind of examples that I was providing to expand and to show me like which is, which is the entire space of possibilities for this, in this case, eight scenarios, yeah, eight uh, design intentions intention that I had, yeah, and. Um, that proves uh, this this was at the beginning a very speculative like not applied in architecture at all just very speculative and but it proved in a way to 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 be quite uh, of a uh, help because i was able then to track in a way to understand certain relationships between certain uh, morphologies that are emerge and also uh, certain aspects of behavioral logics uh, when working with agent-based systems. Yeah? And I think also an interesting thing for me was this kind of aspect of how do you couple these kind of non-linear systems which are agent-based systems uh, with um, AI and help have AI help you in a way explore that kind of problem of non-linearity in a way in agent-based systems yeah? where um, just because you input something, uh, there's not a direct link between input and output in a way. Yeah? Um, so for, for that, uh, I started to create a, a sort of um, Java app uh, for agent-based systems that has, in a way, uh, all the entire system uh, wired, in a way, to a to net, no network. Yeah? So what you have here, you have, um, you're able to run a bunch of uh, design explorations with agent-based systems. And then all the system parameters, all the system, all the strands that are uh, created, 
all the attractor or other kind of um, objects that you input into the system are saved into a data set. And then that data set, you can start to use it to actually train the network to help you def uh, define these kind of design spaces that are a bit more active in layout. So you can search for things in a more active way. So these are all, um, as you can see, they are running in 3D, but mostly what you're doing, you have a network that learns the parameters of a system, parameters that define in a way this kind of um, agent-based compositions. And once you have that, you can now have a uh, sort of design space explorer that you can just use to navigate design in this kind of way. Huh? And these are just some uh, 3D um, uh, results of, of those uh, explorations. So this idea was then pushed forward and um, I'm always looking at, uh, at design as a sort of holistic, uh, I have a holistic approach to design uh, where you have a, I understand that there, there are multiple design tasks in a way that you're dealing with when you're designing something. Huh? And then the idea is like for me, how, how can you um, create or start to connect a variety of interconnected networks to address in a way all those design tasks yeah, that you're dealing with. And uh, in this case, there is a, a, a the project is structured in a sort of three phase, uh, three main parts, um, that the part of exploration, qualifying, and generating. Yeah? And the part of exploration mostly deals also with synthesis and also uh, sort of exploration. And then you have qualifying criteria, which is like how to evaluate design. And once you have a machine that is able to do the, these two things, like explore and qualify, then my argument will be that you, you can uh, have a machine that uh, starts to be creative in a way because it starts to, to take or the outputs are not just random. Yeah? There is a certain uh, criteria how do, those outputs are generated. And this, uh, just to iterate here a bit. So this is a sort of like very uh, multi-model kind of approach to things, modular kind of logic, uh, and an end-to-end kind of data-driven uh, creative process. Yeah? So for, for all this process for us to work, because we were engaging with agent-based systems and, uh, and AI, so we had to develop somehow um, uh, tools that helped us um, encode structural heuristics into agent-based systems, yeah? And to have this kind of real-time kind of feedback when it comes to agent-based systems and, and structural um, performance, yeah? Uh, so here we, we started to develop our own like um, surrogate models for topology optimization, and then uh, those uh, topology optimization models, they predict in a certain distribution, and then you have agent-based systems that start to, to follow that distribution. So you change the constraints, and then you have a new prediction, and that runs pretty much uh, real time. And just, I'm going to go briefly through this. So this is an entire design project that we did with, with the students here at uh, Florida Atlantic. And what you're looking at here, you're looking at almost like 40 for in neural networks that we work with, uh, different types of networks, um, each network having different data sets in a way. Huh? So you have networks that are dealing just with aspects of explorations. So for example, Midjourney and uh, Dali will be amazing candidates for exploration or diffusion models. But then you need also to evaluate certain results, yeah? how you qualify the results, yeah? uh, how you qualify uh, quantitative versus qualitative criteria. Yeah? Um, so probably there you have to develop different kinds of networks that will somehow learn uh, how to evaluate the results from the explore phase. And once you have those connected, then, then you start to have like a generate phase that actually um, have an have a interconnect set of networks that are able to evaluate and explore at the same time and then output for you something else. Yeah? And here I'm just going to go very briefly through, through the process just to show you. Um, just a second, seems like my presentation is freezing. Okay, there you go. Um, so I'm just going briefly through this. And um, the second phase, you know, as you can see, this is the, the part where we start to develop um, the networks for qualifying phase, where we start to um, almost like uh, in some aspects, uh, when you work with agent-based systems, you always have this kind of problem of looking at a screen and um, you have this kind of very complex strand kind of formation. And it's very hard to tell from the 2D screen, 
if those strands are um, very well connected or not. Yeah. And what we were doing here with with um, computer vision, we were, uh, de we developed um, or we trained certain networks to be able to look at these kind of results from uh, agent-based systems and give us predictions about how bundled certain um, results are, how sparse or not, yeah, and other qualities that uh, we found uh, important for us, yeah. So in that way, then we can easily like explore. Uh, with an with a agent-based system and have predictions about how, how, how good in a way the outcome is, yeah? And this is also something that applies at a, a 3D level. So we have, we have networks that work also in 3D. Uh, they are still very experimental, but um, they do work in 3D. Uh, and the same kind of logic applied also there. Yeah? So once you start to create a sort of messing on the project, how you start to evaluate, which are the criteria that you use to evaluate a good result or bad result. Yeah? So here we start to, to have like uh, 10 criteria that we um, tested again, and um, all this run in a way, uh, in that kind of way. Yeah? So like this, we can always expand and contract in a way design spaces and easily evaluate the, uh, the resulting design space yeah? and evaluate and explore which options are actually um, uh, the options that we are interested in. And these are just um, some of uh, the results of, of those processes, yeah? some of the architectures that are coming out of that. Uh, but still very speculative, like uh, I was mentioning uh, at the beginning. I'll, I'm going to show some project that was very speculative, and then I'm going to show also some projects that are more um, applied in practice. Yeah. Um, so, language models and uh, this this kind of explosion of Dali and Mid Journey, um, they advanced extremely in the past in the past years. Yeah. Um, so we have now. Um, uh, before two years ago, we had something uh, called Clip, yeah, and then we have Vikigan, and then we had Dali, and suddenly now we have Mid Journey, and we have Dali two, and we have many many other kind of networks that are uh, dealing with language models, yeah. Um, and uh, unlike uh, generative models, uh, this Dali and uh, Mid Journey and diffusion models in general, um, they do require large data set, but um, GAN models, they were not very good at scaling. Yeah? It was very hard in a way to train uh, neural networks like GANs with um, millions and millions and millions of images and to have st stable results in a way. Uh, but with uh, diffusion models, we can actually train massive uh, models uh, with 400 million images, for example, yeah? and uh, have a model that actually learns correctly and um, and outputs quite convincing results, I'll say. So these are, these are the, the, again, uh, um, the kind of networks that are very, very dominant right now, yeah, and they're very popular right now. And the basic idea around a, um, a uh, diffusion model is that um, this idea is if, if we can build a learning model that can learn the systematic decay in a way of information due to noise, we should be able to also to reverse that the process and thus recover some hot information from the noise. Yeah, so that's that's the, the core principle behind that uh, diffusion model. Yeah, if you are able to uh, learn how we are adding the uh, Gaussian noise to an image until we cannot recognize the image, we should be able also to reverse that process and go from a noise and generate an image. Yeah. So I'm going to show here some results from Mid Journey, but uh, my approach here to Mid Journey um, is not necessarily to to try to use the network as a way to just uh, output for me super specific things. Yeah? Uh, so these are uh, some examples, some um, uh, a method that uh, I, I was working with uh, lately, um, where what I'm doing mostly I'm trying to develop first a few concepts. Yeah. They are not architectural concepts, they are just concepts. Yeah? In this case, yes, it's an architectural concept just because it's facade. Yeah? But if you're looking at, at uh, the entire description, um, the description doesn't have that much to do with architecture. Yeah? Uh, it's mostly trying to describe a certain quality that I'm interested in. Yeah? And same also, I'm looking then at um, domain outside of uh, architecture. And I'm saying, okay, 
I'm interested perhaps in this kind of um, underwater explosions, yeah, ink explosions. Um, so I want to bring somehow these qualities from ink explosion and th those kind of very um, intricate in a way uh, flow fields or um, ornate uh, wood. I want to bring some somehow those together and perhaps create a sort of chair. Yeah. Um, so here, then, what I'm doing, I start to combine ideas. You know, so I start to say I have two concepts. One one of the concepts is this kind of uh, wood wooden in a way network, uh, very uh, ornate in a way, and then this kind of idea of uh, underwater swirling, you know, a ink explosion. Yeah? And the idea is you can now with with this kind of uh, network, you can easily conceptually engage in this kind of explorations. Yeah. Which are very speculative. I'm not going to call them architecture because they are not architecture. They are very interesting in a way, uh, methods of exploring certain ideas. So in this case, for example, you can easily try to balance the, the weights of each of the two uh, concepts that I previously developed. Yeah? Um, and then you can say, uh, you can see like once you have one concept that is overpowering the other one, you have a completely different kind of effect yeah, that is resulting. Yeah? So in first example on the uh, left side, you see the, uh, the facade and the wood in a way still more dominant. Yeah? You have a weight of three while the uh, underwater um, explosion is mostly one. Yeah? And once you reverse that relation, yeah, you start to see it's almost like the explosion becomes wood somehow. Yeah? It starts to be uh, woodified or how we can call it. Yeah? Which is very interesting, yeah. But then the idea is like, how can I create a chair out of that? Yeah. And here, what I start to do is I start to combine then the third concept, which in this case is a design concept. It's a um, it's a chair, yeah, an, an element, a design element that I'm interested in. So I have two concepts at the beginning that have nothing to do with a the chair. They are just describing idea, certain concept, yeah. And then the third one is giving me the specific. Um, object that I'm interested in, yeah? And in that way, then, I start to create um, these kind of chairs that that are more interesting than just uh, trying to create a chair that already exists, you know, yeah? And the same, the same kind of principles uh, played out also in these kind of explorations. And uh, they are quite interesting, and I, I know a lot of people right now, they are engaging uh, in these kind of explorations, and it's very exciting. Um, but for sure, they have their own limitations, yeah? Um, so in this case, I was trying to figure out, um, is the network actually aware that there is a relationship between um, the morphology of something and or of an object and its materiality? Uh, because something made out of wood has a specific aesthetic and um, uh, morphology just because of the constraints that the wood as material brings to the table, yeah? While also concrete has its own constraints, yeah? And um, I was quite surprised in a way to see that probably it's not, I cannot say like with 100% um, certainty that the network really uh, is able to understand this relationship, but I can tell that it's, it's generating pretty convincing results, yeah? I will not make a big claim to say that it's already understanding it, but uh, the results are pretty convincing. Like um, I, I can see that this network can develop in a direction where uh, at one point, it will be able to tell a uh, kind of um, a relationship, yeah. And the segment of idea here uh, with all this kind of exploration, so uh, which are the concepts that I want to embed into the architecture that I want to create, and not architecture as in build, but uh, architecture rep rep representation of an architecture, let's say, yeah. Uh, so in this case, like, which are the concepts that I have to uh, develop to um, inform that um, mid journey network to generate for you for, for me this kind of qualities that I'm interested in. Yeah? So then it's mostly about that for me. Yeah? I know that many people are searching specifically for things, uh, but for me, I'm always I'm very influenced by uh, one of uh, something that Wolf Briggs uh, says all the time: this kind of idea of obedience in advance. So if you if you are um, if you, if you start to draw something and you're already aware that you're going to do that out of um, um, concrete and then uh, it's going to uh, cost this much and that much, what you're going to do, you're going to start to uh, limit in a way your creativity 
just because you're you start to be aware of all those constraints yeah so here i think the same thing happens when you work with mid journey and you just type in like super specific um, um uh, prompts yeah because if you if you ask for a building only a building is going to come out of that nothing else yeah but if you want to create something more and try to explore the limits of what a, a building might be then probably you have to develop like ideas concepts more than be specific about that you want to design a building you know so dali on the other hand it's quite amazing yeah dali it's super super high resolution but um, my experimentation with dali at this point um, it seems to be very uh, dali seems to be very literal and um in the sense of if if i input concepts that are are very vague in a way the network is not really able to output so interesting results if i give specific things that it's going to be able to output things and here i just want to show uh, this example so in this case i was trying to to figure out like can this network um, which are which how vague can i be with this network to generate for me something interesting and in this case something very unexpected happened so i was asking for a smooth curvilinear museum and i ended up with bilbao yeah and why i'm showing this slide is because this leads me to the next problem here so one of the problems that i see with these networks is that um, right now they are amazing networks they they have they are trained with genetic uh, generic data sets which is uh, very cool um, but at the same time they uh, they end up having very strong biases you know um, and the reason for why they have strong biases and what i mean by biases i mean strong preferences towards a specific category let's say um, they have strong biases because mostly uh, somebody just scraped the net for images yeah and then they just use those images to train these networks yeah and the problem with that is that there are some architects that for sure are going to be more uh, overrepresented than other architects yeah and what's happening then i'm asking here for a museum curvilinear museum and i'm actually getting literally guggenheim museum yeah uh, which is for Hungary, and then also I can feel some some vibe of uh, Oscar Niemeyer uh, kind of architecture, you know? but those are strong biases then, you know, because I, I was not referring at all. If you look at the prompt, I was not referring at all to anything that might describe Gary or uh, or uh, Oscar Niemeyer. You know? If curvilinearity equal uh, Zaha or um, or uh, for Hungary or you know Oscar Niemeyer, then uh, we have a big problem you know so for me then this is this this was a um, um, quite a concerning aspect yeah when I when I had that, that kind of result I already was thinking about these ideas before but that result was very clear so what I started to do I started to say okay I think we have to as architects we have to um, take control in a way of our domain and try to collaborate perhaps yeah with other computer science people and try to create our own networks that are fine-tuned for architecture architecture correctly that's not to say that we are going to ignore um, all the other like uh, generic data sets which i think they are very valuable to bring in um, new ideas and new explorations but I, the idea here will be we should be able to take a model that was already trained and in this case i'm using a model that was trained with 400 million uh, gen uh, generic data set um, and I'm trying to fine-tune that model so that it's able to recognize correctly some architecture ideas yeah and uh, the architecture that I'm inputting here like is not just one specific architect uh, architect there are multiple uh, architects that I'm including in that data set so right now currently I'm uh, in phase one so um, I just finished the training um, of the first hundred um, the first 10k with 50 uh, 500k um, epoch iterations yeah um, and right now uh, I'm, I'm starting the, the phase two where I'm going to have a thousand uh, 100,000 images and train it and see why the result of that yeah and the the goal here is to to reach to a level where we have 100 um, images at least yeah uh, 100 million images uh, in the data set of architecture so these were some early um, early results of this and uh, slowly in a way um, i'll keep on training the network and trying to fine-tune certain aspects getting better the data sets um, it started to to actually uh, show some some very promising results in a way.
And um, these are some of the latest ones. And um, this, they start to, in a way, um, show that it's kind of picking up a bit on the virtuality quite well. Uh, spaces, it's able to generate quite interesting um, spaces. Um, but I will say it's still somehow um, very biased towards a specific style of architecture because right now I'm not um, I'm not um, asking for any specific style. I'm just um, querying, I believe, something like um, uh, a beautiful building you know, made out of concrete, steel, and wood. Yeah, and in the end, these are some of the results. Yeah, so. Um, this, this is fine, yeah? but for me, it's like 10,000 images with uh, 500K um, training. Um, I think it's a, uh, it's a promising, in a way, um, result and um, shows potential, so um, makes me, in a way, want to push forward and um, stay on track, in a way, with this, with this project, yeah? And these are just a uh, few other results. Um, so the, the benefit here is that in architecture, we have um, or the way that I'm training this is uh, very high resolution. Um, most of the division models are trained with uh, uh, 128 by 128 resolution or 2056, 256. I'm training right now this with 512. So probably uh, that's going to help quite a lot in terms of um, um, details, you know, resolution. So the project now that it's a less speculative, it's a bit more applied to, um, in practice, uh, is the project uh, the Pinot Blanc. And uh, you can also find this project um, more about this project. Uh, unfortunately, this one is not working. Um, more about this project you can also find in the, uh, the newest uh, issue of AD, Machine Hallucinations, uh, where, uh, where we, were, we are presenting this project. So uh, what is DPO Blau? DPO Blau is a cumulative um, effort or the result of a cumulative effort uh, undertaken by Copio Blau in Vienna. Uh, and it operates at the intersection between architecture practice and um, AI deep learning. Um, so um, right now, uh, this is a team um, dealing with the DPO Blau project in, uh, in Vienna. Um, and um, if, for those of you that are not very familiar with uh, with Office, the, the Office architecture is very, um, very uh, buoyant, very um, complex, and I'm mentioning this just because um, quite quite uh, a challenge in a way to to try to train certain neural networks to to learn uh, such a complex in a way style. Um, so one of also another uh, one of uh, or another challenges with this kind of AI models is that they are domain specific systems. Uh, when uh, and when you use this kind of systems in architectural design as discrete systems to address multiple uh, architectural systems or tasks, they tend to flatten in a way the relationships between architectural systems. Yeah, uh, and that's rather problematic because um, um, the outcome of architectural processes is codependent somehow on multiple uh, interrelated systems. And in the end, we want AI models to be aware of this variety of correlationships between architectural systems. Um, because design, in the end, again, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-model kind of in, endeavor uh, where different tasks can be addressed at various um, degrees of abstraction uh, through mediums like text, images, renderings, and so on, you know, 3D. Um, so because of this reason, to address, in a way, this kind of concern. And um, like I, I was mentioning at the beginning with Midjourney and so on, Midjourney mostly is just an image synthesis uh, uh, network. And it's only good at that, uh, just creating a um, uh, synthesis of, uh, of an image uh, based on the data set yeah, that uh, was provided with. Um, so in that regard, it might be good that network might help in certain particular design tasks, but it's not going to be able to address all the design tasks that we are dealing with. Yeah? So therefore, the way that we, we created, um, or I created a, a DPO Lab network is, it's a, a sort of node-based kind of uh, system or network of interconnected neural networks, where some nodes may uh, automate partially processes and other modes um, uh, augment. Yeah? So those that are automating, perhaps they are just streamlining the overall uh, workflow. Yeah? 
And the node-based structure of, of the POLA network um, enables this kind of task dependent strategies of interconnected networks to uh, establish, uh, to be established in response to discrete design tasks or specific design problems. Yeah? So depending on the specific design problem that you are dealing with, you can easily go into the network and start to connect specific nodes in that network, nodes that deal with simply just image synthesis and others that deal only with 3D, for example. Yeah? And you have those nodes connected and like that you start to interact yeah, with the network. Uh, so the different nodes are categorized um, as following uh, as following uh, specific architecture criteria such as uh, technical, organizational, or formal issues like uh, Gestalt, um, while still uh, utilizing in a way uh, the potential of the entire um, uh, copy and blau data set. Yeah? The main potential uh, though lies uh, in finding ways to amplify the intelligence of the practice of the office. Um, sum up in these terms of aut automation and augmentation. Um, so sometimes uh, I think that automation very often has uh, bad connotations in a way, uh, especially when we talk about design, because the question is, uh, do we want to automate design? And for me, it's not necessarily um, that we automate design. What we are doing is, in many instances in design, we are not going to explore certain edges or certain like peripheries of the, of the um, design space because it's too expensive for us to, to search or to try to explore those ideas. Yeah? Uh, so then we are just sticking with ideas that we already know that are more safe. Yeah? They're not that risky, like the ones that are on the, uh, on the fringe or, or on the edge. Yeah? And then we are just engaging with the ones that we are uh, more comfortable with. Yeah? But if you have a process that is already automated, that will allow you actually to engage with those kind of ideas that are more fringe in a way on, uh, when it comes to the design space. Yeah? Uh, so this aspect then, uh, we are looking at all, all kind of design process that we engage with. At the beginning, we started with something like this. We tried to automate or streamline certain processes, and then uh, it just took off in a way, and we started to, to address like multiple, multiple other kind of topics that uh, we find interesting in a way to address. Uh, so for example, here, we are looking at organizational aspects, um, uh, having uh, one of the nodes of uh, our network, figuring, uh, figuring out uh, compositional kind of um, rules and being able to create uh, massive models. Uh, we are also interested in this uh, kind of aspect of environmental aspects like um, solar radiation and other environmental um, topics. Uh, the aspect of uh, technical kind of nodes, uh, we are looking at, at um, networks that are able to help with um, optimizations of uh, surface rationalizations or other kind of fabrication kind of um, um, topics. Um, for some reason, my video seems uh, not working. Uh, just give me a second. I'm going to just turn on and off this. Okay, let's switch it back. Hopefully, it's going to work now. So the same happens also with kind of a streamlining processes. So perhaps you can start to uh, model a physical model. Uh, yeah, build a physical model and then have an app, perhaps. Um, that you can use your phone with um, to give you like some indication of um, how how that shape that you just physically modeled how that will actually perform environmentally. Yeah? Um, so in that instance, that we are speeding up and we are streamlining certain processes. Yeah? So the same idea also here, like uh, trying to to figure out perhaps certain facade aesthetics. So before you even engage in this kind of process of wrapping and back and forming or or this kind of process, perhaps you just have an AI that gives you a hint in a way, um, what will be the direction? Yeah? If you go in that direction, what kind of outcome you might have? Yeah? So as the semantics and the style of, uh, of the computer law are very, very complex and are not necessarily homogeneous, one of the main challenges uh, was how to design the network so that it's, it learns correctly. Uh, the semantic representation of the data set. Um, because what's happening is that you might have, uh, where you have this kind of bigger clusters, uh, those clusters, they might represent projects that were already built. So we have a lot of documentation of those projects, yeah? But that's not to say just because the project was built, that's not to say that that's the most representative in a way project for the style of the office in a way, yeah? So if you end up like having, um, 
not uh, taking into consideration this aspect, you are going to bias the network towards that specific building in a way. Huh? And whatever output you get from it is going to be very specific to that building that dominates kind of the, the data set. Yeah? So then the idea is like how you how you can balance your like data set. Yeah? So we have different methods of augmenting based on features and um, that's that's uh, a one a one way of looking at it. Yeah? Uh, in our case, because we are an office of um, almost uh, 40, 50 years of uh, practice, we have a lot of data sets. We have access to all our project, uh, 90, 90, 950, 900, 950 uh, projects uh, for which we have the 3Ds, uh, renders, uh, you know, all these kind of depth maps for uh, from renders or different kind of uh, steps, um, rendering steps from renders that can help us in a way train the network in sound way. And I'm just going to go uh, a bit faster today. So these are just uh, progression in a way when we started, it was quite, quite um, um, low resolution, but it was showing uh, promising results. And then slowly we start to uh, getting uh, to get better and better and better at um, fine tuning the network and also the data set. Uh, and then we ended up with this problem that also computational design has or parametric design where you're able to create a ton of variation, but the problem then is how you explore all those variations and how you evaluate those, uh, those um, um, variations, yeah? Um, because um, most of the time in design, we are not talking about just one criteria of evaluation, you know? We have multiple criteria that we use to evaluate things. So suddenly if you have 10 criteria and you have like 100, uh, samples, how you are going to evaluate that, how long is it going to take you to do that, yeah? So what we start to do is, and we start to look or to orient a bit towards uh, our designers in the office uh, and start to question like, uh, how are the designers in the, in the office going to use uh, this kind of networks, yeah? Uh, so we start to, def uh, to develop some strategies like latest space explorer, latest space uh, explorations, projections, uh, space queries, and so on. Um, so here is just a, a um, explorer where uh, they can just go on a browser and um, explore the space and this space constantly gets uh, uh, more and more and more uh, information is getting to this uh, cloud in a way to this space and they can start to explore uh, the network this way so in this way you don't need any computational kind of uh, knowledge you don't need to have that computational knowledge and then this can be easily explored yeah, because you start to understand perhaps that certain uh, regions of this space of this cloud in a way uh, has particular kind of um, aesthetics and particular types of buildings and so on. Yeah? So you can easily intuitively uh, start to learn in a way which regions you have what kind of aesthetics and uh, like this makes it very easy for, for designers to engage with that. Uh, so the same happens for the uh, uh, sections and uh, and uh, um, floor plans kind of data sets and uh, the networks and the same happens also for the 3D networks. So they're able to explore things and one one other logic that it's a bit more advanced uh, needs a bit more knowledge uh, for the designer to engage with. It's kind of idea of searching for the uh, closest uh, neighbors in a way, like closest similarity. Um, which are the, the kind of samples results that are very similar or very dissimilar to this input, yeah? So in this way, I can easily um, search for variations that are very close to the input image or very far away from the input image, yeah? And this idea uh, is something that also uh, we play with, with this, uh, in this video where we are, what we are doing, we are searching for the next closest in a way, and we keep on going from the next closest to the next, next closest and so on, yeah? So that, that starts to push you in a way to, to that space of close neighbors somehow, yeah? But that's, again, a problem with the fact of, uh, that's very um, specific, it's algorithmic in a way, you have to know how you're searching for those things. So that makes, makes it very uh, unusable for um, a big part of, uh, of our designers, yeah? Uh, so what we start to look at then, uh, when uh, Clip came out, we start to look at how can we use text prompts to query um, the, the network's memory in a way, or the latent, uh, the network's latent space to query for certain solutions, yeah? So um, if a designer 
uh, wants to extract something from the latent space of our network, they just have to type in a text, a building with two intersecting volumes, let's say, yeah? and uh, the network should be able to output for, for that designer um, certain images that have that you know, quality. Yeah? So here you see uh, the way that we are doing that. So irregular shape of his tower. So um, you can ask for how many, in a way, outputs you want to get. Yeah? So in this case, you have just six. Yeah? And then you can ask, or you can go and um, ask for 20, 30, 40, 100, yeah? closest to, to the text that you're describing in here. And these are some of uh, the results, yeah? like when you query through the latent space. Yeah? And for us, one of the challenges was that, okay, but what if we also want to go the other way around? What if we don't want to just query? What if we want to also have models that generate? Yeah? So this is where we start to, to train our own uh, diffusion models with uh, copium allowed data sets and um, try to reverse that process. Yeah? Instead of querying, extracting only uh, from the latent space, we are asking actually now a network to generate based on the prompt. Yeah? similar with DALI and with, uh, with Journey. Yeah? So these are some of those uh, results. And the same thing happens right now with the 3D networks. So right now we have the 3D node that um, uh, works quite well when it comes to um, latest space explorations, interpolations between uh, different elements. Uh, but right now, uh, this is a, a, a thing that we are working on. We are trying to, to develop the, um, the 3D diffusion, diffusion model for, for this and um, to, to try to see, okay, because we have for images, we have this option to query uh, a latent space that is mostly based on images. We are able to query a latent space that is based on uh, 3Ds, but we are not able to yet, query, uh, not able to use prompts to generate 3Ds, yeah? And that's, that's mostly uh, the next step there, yeah? Um, so uh, I think this is uh, the last slide. Um, so thank you everyone for, for taking your time to be here. Um, so yeah, I hope that we are going to engage in, um, in a discussion now. Um, I'm, I'm personally, I'm, I'm very, very um, engaged with these networks at a sort of holistic level. I'm always trying to look at design from, from all these levels and um, scales and so on. Yeah? because I don't see it necessarily as you have a network and uh, that network already creates architecture in a way. It creates perhaps an idea that then has to be pushed uh, further with a different kind of system and another kind of network perhaps. And then perhaps you are going to end up with something that it's actually um, an architecture. Yeah? Um, so thank you everyone. And uh, I'm looking forward for your question. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. It was a very, very extensive uh, exposition and in a sense a, a very deep, a, a lot of content. I really love it. So I hope everyone enjoy the, the, the conference. So I, I have a, if, um, if someone has a couple of questions, they can write it on the chat or I can start. So I have a couple of questions. Um, let's say I have, a, <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Let's start with just one. Um, uh, you talk about, uh, at, the, at the beginning of the lecture, you talk about uh, three concepts about interpolation, extrapolation, and invention. And it, uh, I found it really interesting in the sense that, uh, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's just a thing that, I, uh, something I, I think about is just like, when you talk about, when someone talk about invention or extrapolations, sometimes it's like, this to, to elaborate a little bit more so when you think about those two concepts in uh, comparison with interpolation you can say maybe we, because we thought we have a, a like um, um embedded let's say embedded like a neural network in our brains that we can elaborate complex things or combination between neural networks uh, neural networks you know, between different uh, interpretations of things so we can kind of invent something or we kind of kind of extrapolate something. Uh, in that sense, I think uh, it, uh, one of the, the last project you show is, is like we start to uh, like combine different neural networks 
that was just really amazing in the sense that we can start having like extrapolations or kind of inventions in the sense of you you start relating different kind of uh, neural networks and that's really complex and really interesting. Um, so I was thinking about that. But what, what do you think about the, the, the possibility of AI to create extrapolation or kind of invention, but not in the sense of, of creating something from nothing. So, uh, but in the sense of similar to human brain or to designer's brain or designer's uh, I think we lost Daniel. <laughs> so it was my question was to to extend maybe. Let's wave back. Uh, let's wave from him a little bit. Okay, sorry. Um, it's okay. Maybe it was uh, the question was too too long, or too, <laughs> too boring. So okay, it's yeah, okay the, if you want to leave. It's the it's Google going, AI. Okay. <laughs> the Google AI decided to close the the meeting. Yeah. yeah. Um, no. So I think uh, extrapolation. I think this is uh, where also that example with the hyperloop. Yeah, and that's the example with the hyperloop. Yeah, because in the end, um, if we were to say that we are just um, interpolating, the interpolation will mean that we just find the same kind of idea of logs with a stone on top, yeah? And we just maybe orient the logs differently, and that's going to give us like maybe a better kind of thing, yeah? But it's not going to go to the level where you say, well, I'm going to have actually an object that is suspended in a, a vacuum in a way, and that's how that object is traveling, yeah? So for me, that's extrapolation. It's not just really invention, yeah? In the sense of it's still based on uh, a lot of ideas, yeah, that were developed by other people, yeah. It's not, uh, it's not invention in that sense, yeah. Um, but then also, like, if you look at the example of Hyperloop, like, yes, that level of figuring out if I have the object in a in a void is going to uh, remove the the, uh, the friction, the air friction. But in the same time, there are multiple other inventions in a way to that machine to to be able to work, yeah. So um, uh, yes, there is one level where you have a network perhaps that figure out that if you remove the air friction, then it's going to go faster. But then you have other perhaps networks, yeah, other humans that figure out like design aspects that help in a way with that kind of idea of um, air friction. Yeah. So for me, that's that's um, the way I see it also when it comes to interconnecting networks yeah, and with deep human law. Yeah? Because I don't see design, you cannot, uh, you cannot say that one network is going to be able to address all these aspects of design by itself. Yeah? Because a lot of these levels, we don't even know ourselves. We don't even know how to separate them. Yeah. So how do you train the network actually to understand those levels of abstraction and so on yeah, that you have um, in a design project? Yeah. So that's that's uh, that was my intuition for me when I started to develop this as an interconnect network. I developed it in that kind of sense. Yeah. Because I was understanding that you cannot you cannot have really um, a network that. It's able to address this, and I think this is one something that uh, a lot of architects are think they are a bit outraged today, uh, these days actually, when it comes to uh, with Journey and Dali, because there are many um, people working with Dali and with Journey that make big claims about um, about the networks. Uh, personally, I'll just go to the level where I'll say uh, with Journey and uh, Dali are more capable than a human to create uh, to synthesize images. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. I'll stop there. I'll not say that those images are architecture, um, but they are amazing when it comes to that. Yeah? But if you couple them now with uh, a different kind of network that perhaps understands certain uh, spatial compositions, now you start to talk. Yeah? Because uh, per perhaps you say, well, I have a network that creates for me the massing kind of, yeah? and maybe uh, certain perspectives of the massings are going to be used as an input for mid journey or DALI. And that's going to give me some ideas, perhaps, how to create the design of this, yeah? So it's still based on the massing, yeah, which has a logic, architecture logic, but maybe it gives me some aesthetical ideas how to, how to go about it, yeah? And once you start to do that, yeah, now you start to say, okay, I'm engaging in a process that is a bit more rigorous and might end up into designing an actual building, you know? 
Yeah, uh, I think it, it's amazing. You also mentioned uh, um, in the, one of the one of your projects about um, three steps. One of the first one was explore, qualify, and generate. Yeah, uh, and generate. And I find it really interesting. Um, two parts of the of the process. One is qualify. When you when you qualify uh, different outputs from the neural network, and then you start to generate about that. And then the, the, uh, there was another step when you start to evaluate all those mm -hmm. results. And I found it really interesting. And my question is like qualifying is kind of uh, is, it has a relationship between I don't know kind of matrix met, uh, metrics for example, or in relation of uh, um, arrays and those kind of uh, comparisons or more not visual data, but um, if they have a relationship with metrics and and the third point if it's like um, when when you have the the evaluation when you have a two dimensional evaluation but sometimes you have a is is based on two do uh, two dimensional criteria so I, I so think I, yeah so I think also there's like uh, depends like there are certain things that uh, for example. Uh, qualifying certain things might be that it's just one value. Yeah? Like um, if it's something very aesthetical and something very subjective, then probably you have to do this kind of like um, manual kind of evaluation where you as a designer, you start to look at certain results, you start to score them. And uh, like that in time, you start to build up in a way a sort of data set that kind of represents perhaps your uh, your um, aesthetical preferences in a way. Yeah? But in other instances, yes, you might want to deal with um, uh, qualifying certain things from a 3D perspective or purely from an image perspective. Yeah? Uh, and I think all of them, they have a value. Yeah? Like, um, I don't think, also when it comes to architecture, many architects are complaining about why don't we have 3D networks. Um, there's a different reason why we don't have yet 3D networks, but I think um, um, 2D has its own role in a way and 3D has it also its, its own role. The same way also when we qualify something, um, to evaluate from a tree perspective, it's one thing. To evaluate from a purely like 2D, like image composition kind of perspective, it's a different thing, you know? And each one of them, it's a, a kind of valuable, I would say, when you evaluate certain things, yeah? So for me, that's that's uh, a sort of uh, way of looking at that. And uh, with the students, that's that's what I'm trying to do, yeah? Like, which is the specific thing that we are looking for when it comes to evaluating that. So um, I think uh, I was showing some examples with purely 2D, in the sense of you have an agent-based system that is running, you have a machine vision um, algorithm that it's running on top of that, it's looking almost like uh, looking at the results just as a 2D, and then it's giving you certain predictions, yeah, certain um, qualifying kind of uh, results. Yeah? So in that sense, yeah, what we were doing that for, we were just doing it because uh, you have this problem of um, when you look at the screen, you're not realizing actually the depth of things or something. Yeah? And you don't uh, realize that all those strands are not really connected, yeah. So you have then uh, the network helping you there, assisting you in a way, yeah. So that's one type of qualifying, yeah. But I think there are many, many different ways how you can uh, qualify that, yeah. Um, it's just uh, I think it's very uh, project specific in a way, and task specific, yeah. Yeah, I, I found it really interesting uh, because. Of that. Sometimes the outputs of the of those kind of net, net, networks are just like thousands of images, and you, it's like the part of picking up picking some of the results is really interesting. That's what I just pointed out because it's really think, interesting. And uh, I think also this aspect of um, so you have these thousands of results, yeah. So one way for you will be well, I'm just qualifying them and I'm just putting a sort of number to to each uh, image or each result. Uh, but in the same time, you can say, well, I'm also going to try to to cluster them, to try to figure out are there relationships between uh, these results, why they are like this, yeah. But like even if you qualify them, like bring them together, yeah, and look at things as a cluster based on that specific quality, yeah, and see in a way now I'm looking at this re uh, design. Why is why is are these grouped together under this criteria? Yeah? Is that a very dominant, important criteria, or is not? Yeah. And suddenly, I think that's that's a nice feedback that you start to get, yeah. That um, and you start to uncover things that uh, typically you'll not uncover 
those kind of uh, ideas, you know, when you work with parametric design or something. You know? And I'm not saying parametric design is uh, bad, you know, I'm a, a big promoter of parametric design. It's just that that's one limitation, perhaps, yeah, that um, parametric design has. And AI can help you actually start to realize, you know, to extract certain insights that normally you'll not be able to extract, yeah. Okay, we, we have a question from uh, Santiago, could be? Yes. Um, no, first of all, Daniel, thank you very much for the presentation. It was amazing, uh, very generous. Um, I, I was I was interested, very interested in, in the Deep Human Blog project. Uh, and the question is, uh, if you have, what are the, you talk about the criteria of selection of images and, and products. Uh, what are the criteria that you are dealing with in the team uh, uh, inside Himmelblad? What uh, what kind of criteria are the team is is the team working on? You mean when uh, working on the data sets or when you are deciding? I don't know. I don't know what what are the stages of the project right now. But I believe that uh, in, inside the the studio you are. You're getting into uh, taking decisions within the team uh, that may be different uh, in a in such a big office uh, than working alone or or doing a, a research for theoretical purposes. I, I believe that I don't know. I, I'm curious about what are the discussions regarding the selection criteria of the results within the program of DP Um So in many cases, of course, uh, with DP Blog, there are certain, um, certain ideas that when you start a project, there are certain ideas, certain concepts that um, you're working on before you even start to design something. You, know, you start to collect almost like references and so on. And then uh, those are certain things that um, you're going to look for in those projects. Yeah? So, uh, for example, uh, you might want to have something that has certain themes like forest-like tree themes. Yeah, it's still a Kupiyama blog project, but has somehow quality of forest kind of to it. Yeah. Um, so, if that's that's a sort of main idea, then of course, when when you're going to engage with the network and um, how you're search, going to search for certain things, it's going to be through that kind of filter. Yeah. Um, the uh, language models that we are uh, building right now. Um, that's one of the big challenges that we have with uh, existing language models, because uh, we try to use certain uh, language models that are already out there, yeah? but they are not specific to the way that we are describing certain things or search, searching for certain things. Yeah? Um, and then uh, we start to train our networks and create a data set in a way that, how do you describe a building? Yeah? For us, we always talk about uh, the type, the topology of it, the massing and so on. Yeah? So then that kind of language has to be somehow in that network as well, yeah? Because then when we start to engage in a design process with that network and we start to say, okay, I wanna have a floating object like a crystal and then a cloud and then a circulation underneath, a pedestrian circulation or something, it has to be understood correctly, yeah? If I'm saying I wanna have this kind of idea of a forest, yeah? If you say that to mid-journey, you're going to end up with a uh, with forest, yeah? In our case, we don't mean it literally. Yeah? When you say forest, yeah, has to have a sort of feeling of forest, but we don't say a forest. Yeah, so in that way, then we are we are able to um, to control things, and to not control, but kind of uh, select, sort, kind of uh, results. Yeah, but we do that just because we already have um, the data sets. We have them trained more or less in the way that we are working uh, in office. Yeah. And uh, that's that's how we are able to control it then, you know. But all revolves around the main ideas that we have at the beginning. And based on that, we start to, uh, in a way, uh, evaluate things and sort things. Great. And one more, uh, surely related to what Federico was asking just now. Um, you showed, I believe, uh, three planes of work that you're working with images, you're working with 3D models, and you're working with plans and sections. Yeah. Are, are these uh, structures uh, mixing together or for now they are working like separate? So the networks, um, they, they are able to be connected. Yeah, it's a, a node-based kind of um, system. So you can easily connect um, an, an image a network with a 3D network and uh, with a section or whatever. Yeah? 
Um, so right now they are not um, they are not 100% let's say influencing each other, but they have an influence on the other network. Yeah, once you connect them. So um, uh, for sure, a, a sort of floor plan network will help you uh, to generate a very pixelated kind of 3D. You know? almost like to grow a sort of uh, tree out of, of that kind of uh, floor plan, yeah? But it's not then, uh, how is that working then with uh, with the section? So that's the thing that we are always trying to figure out, okay, how are these connected, yeah? Um, but I think for us right now, the setup that we have, I think it's uh, it's going to allow us to, um, to have the network somehow interact much more. Right now it's a level that I would say it's quite decent, you know, in terms of interaction, but, um, there can be improvements for sure, you know. Uh, but they are, true, yeah, they are influencing to us. Uh, to answer your question, they are influencing each other, but they're not influencing at one hundred percent. Let's say, yeah, okay. they are, you know, like, yeah, like that. It's great. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. So, okay. I, if we don't have questions from the good luck, <laughs> I have a couple more. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you mentioned about the the problems with Midjourney and Dali, um, the strong biases and the preference of for categories. Um, considering that, just like thinking about how you think how important it is to create um, like some more wide data sets for architecture, or but you mentioned it in the in the lecture, so. Is, is it, yeah, so is, for me, I think it's super important. Yeah, I know, I know some certain people are, um, um, I think um, somebody was saying, you know, that um, that will create a very biased network if you do it with architectural data sets. And it's better to have it with genetic data sets because generic data sets is, uh, are going to not bring architecture in but they are going to create somehow architecture. And for me, that's that's a sort of like, I think we are projecting when we say that, yeah? Uh, projecting in the sense of we are we are trying to, to say that the network is doing what we as humans are able to do, yeah? Because we as humans, we are able to look at nature and out of nature, we are able to extrapolate and create an arch architecture, yeah? A building. But in the case of uh, the networks that we have right now, Midjourney and DALI, they are image synthesis networks. They are not networks that are looking at na nature and understands in a way how to translate the concept from nature into an architectural concept, yeah? So uh, I think uh, right now what's happening, like architects are kind of um, those that are saying, you know, that um, um, you don't need architectural data sets. I think they are projecting in a way our own like uh, human, in a way, abilities onto the networks. Uh, I think we need uh, architectural data sets, yeah? Um, because these networks are not able to to understand that relationship, yeah? But once uh, I'll, I would like to have them combined with uh, with uh, generic data sets. Yeah, I will not uh, I will not have advocate for isolated in a way data sets. Although those isolated data sets and this is again a discussion of depends. You know, um, the same way that I'm evaluating mid journey, the same way I'm going to evaluate this depends on which is the task, what you're trying to do with it. Yeah, uh, because mid journey, I'm going to say image synthesis. I'm going to evaluate it like that. It's great. Yeah, but I'm not going to say that it's architecture. So here, if I'm saying um, I want to train a neural network that is going to help us as architects to explore, almost like histor uh, to go back in history and explore some ideas about style and the relationships between different styles and so on, yeah? I can create the network only with architectural data set for that, yeah? So that's the task of the network, just to help us in a way, like almost like as a history class to explore architecture and the past in that kind of way, yeah? So that's an amazing thing, yeah? Uh, but then if I'm saying um, I want to create a network and, that, and the task of the network is to create design or to create not design, but uh, representations of, uh, of buildings, then probably I'll not limit it just to buildings. Yeah? Probably I'll say uh, there are a lot of cool ideas in other domains outside of uh, architecture that will be uh, important to have included in the data set, yeah? Because design is bigger than just architecture, then, yeah. So then, in that instance, I'll say, no, we need data sets, architectural data sets, yeah, but also generic data sets, yeah. When we get to the point where we have networks that are capable to look at domain, non architectural domains and create architecture, then uh, that will be an amazing day. But right now, I don't think we, we have that, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, it's been a 
a nice lecture and thank you daniel for for your time to be here in the instituto of architecture institute of architecture so uh, i want to thank you again thank you very much for your time and that will thank be you <laughs> thank you thank you for having me uh, i really enjoyed it so uh, let's keep the discussion going yeah uh, yeah of course sure thank you daniel okay. Very generous. Okay. See you soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.